Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome uh, once again to the uh, Authentic Caribbean Rum uh, Hangout Sessions. Um, we have a very, very uh, interesting uh, mix of uh, professionals here with us today. Um, as you know, uh, the Authentic Caribbean Rum Mark has just launched uh, its uh, training for professionals uh, in North America, and the training is going to be um, delivered by uh, an excellent team of professionals that we call our um, international panel uh, of spirits experts. Uh, and we have a very, very uh, exciting representation of the panel here today. Um, I'm going to briefly introduce each of the members, uh, and then I'll, I'll, I'll introduce the, the theme of discussion for today. Um, on on the far left, we have uh, Daniele Tatarin from uh, the Kiefer in Vancouver. Hi, Dani. Next to her, we have uh, Gabriele Panaccio from Montreal. Hello. In the middle, we have uh, H. H. Ehrman uh, from Elixir in San Francisco. Next to him is Jason Cousins uh, from New York. And last but not least, uh, Peter Vastinos uh, in Chicago. Uh, thank you guys for being here today. Um, it's exciting times at the moment for us. Uh, oh, we've been joined by Miguel, our panel member from uh, the Dominican Republic. Hi, Miguel. How are you doing? Hi, how are you? Good. Great. How are you guys? Excellent. Hey, just in time. We've just begun. So uh, you joined for the last introduction. So uh, nice to see you. Um, in the Dominican Republic, I assume. Yep. Excellent. Punta Cana. Punta Cana. Some people have all the luck. Anyway, uh, the, the, the topic of, of today's Hangout um, is um, how to classify rum. And uh, the, the traditional way of um, classifying rum has always been um, saying rum is either Latin, Latin style rum, uh, English style rum, and French style. Uh, this has been the way that the, the hundreds of uh, rum brands around the world have been classified traditionally. Uh, I wanted to, to, to begin the discussion with just a very quick and top line um, uh, view of each of the panel members of what they think about this uh, uh, classification and and how they think uh, we should approach it as a category. So I'll begin with, with uh, Daniele from Vancouver. Danny, what, what, what's your opinion about this classification? Well, I think classifying spirits <clears throat> is, is important. Um, uh, from my experience with uh, tasting the rums from the ACR um, group uh, of Spirits. They were. They did stand out and were, I guess, different uh, in flavor profiles from different rums. So, I mean, and types of cane and um, stills that are used. I mean, are the same in all of the in all of the rum brands. I mean, you can say the same for any spirit, I guess, but it's the products that they're using and the areas that they're being um, produced in that kind of make the spirit stand out as opposed to, you know, different brands of whether or not it be rum or other spirits. Thank you, Danny. Um, Gabriele, what, what, what do you think? Yeah, as when you say, I think, yeah, classification is good um, for the profile flavor between uh, French or uh, Spanish um, rum, but I think there's also, um, it's great to talk about different kind of classification as um, blending um, classification or different type of, um, if they add flavor like spice rum or rum punch, um, because other than the principal um, category as French or Spanish, there's other way um, that we can classify, classify it from. Yeah, I'm, that, that's, uh, that's a fair comment. H, uh, what do you think? The, 
I'm a bit of a history nut, so uh, you can classify, and, and some of these rooms have been classified as uh, French, Spanish, or, or English. I think a lot of the, long, the way along the lines of the history of the rums and the development of the rum market as well as the development of rum production. And then you also, I mean, that, that classification comes into the languages spoken in these areas that they come from. And there are differences in the way these rums are produced. So there's some, for a long time, there's been some justification in breaking them into those three kind of buckets in order to make it easy to understand rum and how they're made. But in reality, rum is produced in such a wide range of uh, distillation processes, uh, traditions, uh, different kinds of stills, and uh, we also have different climates and, and uh Believe it or not, a lot of people don't realize that within the Caribbean you do have some, some different climates. Different islands have different topography and they have wet and dry regions, colder and, and warmer regions, regions that get more fog and or no fog. So uh, there's a lot of differences in the way that these rums can be made and that's just within the Caribbean, let alone the, the grander size of the worldwide market. Uh, the, this this market of authentic Caribbean rums, or the rums that we represent, uh, represents only 17 percent, I think, of the mm -hmm. of the market, the global market. So that, you know, when people think of rum, I think they think of the Caribbean, and they 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 categorize categorize all rums as Caribbean. But when you look at that number, it's actually a rather small part of the of the the big pie. And these rums can be described in so many ways based on how they're made. So. It's easy for people speaking as a bartender when you're when you're talking to a new uh, customer, a, a new rum drinker, someone who's trying to get into rum. It's easy to put them into those buckets, but when you look at the broader spectrum of, of what's out there and what can be put in the glass, uh, it can go from uh, very light and clear and uh, almost vodka-like style of highly distilled rum to the juiciest, beefiest, oiliest, funkiest. Mm -hmm. glass of something that resembles syrup. So uh, those styles are, are, are old and uh, I think and we are trying to dispel them by expanding upon the education level of people as far as what's out there. Yeah, that's, I mean, that very interesting point. And there's, there seems to be an oversimplification of, of the category uh, and it's a a, it's not really a fair representation of the versatility and the diversity that, that H was talking about. Jason, what, what's your opinion? Yeah, to, uh, to H's point, um, it does provide a good uh, starting point, uh, a good jumping off ground for anybody who's just getting into rum, be it a new bartender or uh, consumers that might be looking for something a little different. Um, and it does give us a framework for understanding these uh, production styles, um, different taste profiles, and the uh, the rich, diverse history of, uh, of these islands. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, we have to be careful because it's very easy to over to oversimplify and to ignore a lot of the uh, the nuance um, that can get lost uh, mm -hmm. in creating these uh, rigid categories. So I think uh, I think it's good to just kind of give a broad grouping, but if you really want to understand, uh, you know, the, the differences between all these different rum producers, you need to kind of take a step back and uh, yeah. a different way of, of categorizing. Miguel, um, you, come, you're, you're, you come from Spain, um, uh, and you're living in one of the, the regions of the world that is world famous for producing these so-called Latin rums, uh, often called industrial rums, uh, uh, which is uh, a strange way of classifying them. What is your perception and what, is, what do you think the perception in a country like the Dominican Republic is about this classification? Um, well, first of all, when, when you talk about classification, <clears throat> Uh, it's important for them, I mean for them, the people who is talking about rum, uh, and for us when we talk about rum to anyone, that the classification is not something that we, um, it, it's not a consequence, it is just a tool that we use to actually simplify things so we can explain to people uh, what rum is. So I think, yeah, we, we have to be careful with that, and in this country, actually, we have to be more careful, because 
uh, chances are that people are going to think of their ROM as the only ROM uh, in the world, actually. Most of the people here, uh, not the producers, but the consumers, the regular consumers in the island, they don't, they're not really familiar with uh, French or British styles of ROM. Uh, actually, when, when you talk to them about them, they're like, wow, really? Uh, not even the, the fact that there are a huge amount of brands making rum outside of the country. And I think that's a common theme in the different islands in the, in the Caribbean. So they are using the categorization or the classification as a tool. It's a very convenient one when you have to let them know what the rum is, not only from a, from a style or a historic point of view, but as a technical point of view as well. Normally, they want to know about two things. What ROM is, meaning what technically it is. And what ROM is, meaning what historically or, or culturally it is. Right? So when, when we talk to ROM drinkers, or no matter if they're, um, if they're already world culture and this or not, um, we used to classify in both ways, right? Technically, it is molasses or cane juice or cane syrup. That's a classification, and at the end, it is a valid, very, very valid classification. The other one is the style, but the style doesn't necessarily say how the rum is made or how the rum is going to taste, unless you know what British are or what Frenches are. When you're in, in within the islands, they don't normally they don't know about the other islands. I mean, about the other cultural. Um, I mean, if they're Spanish islands, they don't know very much about French islands or British islands. And I think that's the same in British islands. They don't, need, they don't necessarily know about, actually, chances are that they don't know about Spanish culture or French culture. So if you talk to them about British style of rum, they still need to know what the technical aspects of that British style of rum is about. So then you have to go, um, and then you're not being simplified. Uh, going like pot steel, column steel, long fermentation, short uh, fermentation and stuff like that. So as you're going to find yourself almost obliged to go in deep on those details, I think that simplifying is exactly what we need when we are classifying styles of rum. Interesting. Um, uh Simplifying as a way of of, uh, of uh, making the category more more accessible, but um, the key point being, uh, is it fair, uh, Peter? I mean, you you uh, are in a bourbon-led uh, revolution sort of market right now, and the level of understanding I assume of bourbon in, in the U.S. is huge. Um, do you think? Uh, a classification of Latin, uh, British, and is fair, or we should uh, expose or you know spread the knowledge of, of the differences that age was talking about, for example. Sorry, I think you're I think, I think you're muted. Yeah. I think it's important to classify just purely for the sake of um, people knowing what the difference that they're tasting. I mean, yeah. if you're tasting a rum that's made from molasses and then comparing it to a rum that's made from uh, sugarcane syrup, you and you're talking to bartenders, they need to kind of know what those flavors are so that they can they can differentiate. I mean, the same goes for if you're looking at bourbon and comparing it to to scotch, you need to know why bourbon is different than scotch. How what what the process is to make bourbon and what the process is to make scotch. I mean, they're very, they're similar spirits and you know, we call them whiskey, but they're made completely different. So the same should apply to rum. I mean, because people need to know why they're, why those differences are appearing in the glass when they're tasting them. So I think it's important for communicating to what to bartenders when we're, we're tasting the spirits that the differences in the production but maybe not like we were saying not necessarily grouping them into the his, in how they've been his, historically identified yeah I think I think you're I mean that that's spot on I mean 
there has to be a difference of production is key to what people are tasting in the glass. And um, the question is, is Latin, French, and, and, and British uh, an accurate way of doing so? Uh, Peter, I, I, I think you had some issues with the, with the microphone. Are we back? Can you hear me now? Yeah, you're back. I can hear you. Thank right. you very much. I, I, I do think it is um, fair to some degree as, as educators, we do need to bring people into a category and how do you sort of funnel people into that category. You know, as we go around the country and do different trainings, uh, especially with programs like the Bartenders Guild, you know, it's amazing to see the different cross-sections of where cities are. And, you know, sometimes you do have to take a step back and assess where your audience is and how do you funnel them or how do you bring them into that category. So as a generalization, um, I think it is a good entrance point, uh, just like H was starting to say, I'm big on the history of spirits. I don't think any other spirit, uh, even the scout could be a close second, uh, has the history of rum as far as the different inf outside influences and different production methods. It's, it, it, it's, it's beautiful, and it's a beautiful story we need to teach, and how did each island get to their own style of rum to that story? Uh, now, your question was about bourbon, and yeah, Chicago is a huge bourbon market. And you'd be surprised that actually a lot of that work is uh, happening without close education. It, it seems like the more people get educated about bourbon, especially with uh, issues like contract producing and where does the juice come from, a lot of people are being turned off from their their favorite bourbons. You know, there's uh, there's this mystique that's created behind certain bourbon brands, and then all of a sudden people find out, oh well, that that brand doesn't actually come from the distillery I thought it did, and then it's been modified and. It's a weird market with bourbon, so sometimes you need to do you need to control that message from the gate. Otherwise, uh, people start to build their own stories, and and then you could have that uh, bite you a little bit if you if you're not honest or uh, clear from the beginning. So, you know, the story of where that rum came from, I think, is is a good starting point. So, so that thank you, thank you, Visa uh, H. Uh, you were talking about um, some of the 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 diversities. Uh, amongst the islands, the, the different methods of production, etc. How would you start um, to provide the sort of an industry classification that Danny was talking about that would be more representative of the of the breadth of styles that can come from different me production methods uh, of rum? Well, um, firstly, starting with the, with this the, the source of flavored source of, of, of the sugar whether it's going to be sugarcane syrup uh, sugarcane juice or molasses so we have those three base ingredients all sources of sugar that that um, Caribbean authentic Caribbean rum has to be made from this and we also know that uh, really I, I, you know and this my studies uh, continue as, as they should always uh, but we know also from talking to just many distillers that, well, yeah, there's always a, di a difference of opinion between distillers on um, what's right and what's wrong. But most distillers say that the source of that sugar really doesn't matter so much in the ending result of the flavor of, of the juice um, of the of the distillate. What's really important is the fermentation and distillation and the and the production of that core flavor. And then, of course, anything that's that's barrel aged. Uh, takes on a good chunk of its uh, ending flavor from the barrel aging process. So the French style, uh, or which typifies the, under the, the name Rum Agricole uh, from Martinique under that AOC, but also that we have styles in other French regions uh, such as uh, Haiti. And that, that is typified uh, by being made from sugarcane juice. They, they tend to have a very grassy, herbaceous kind of quality to them, and uh, that is one way of looking at uh, a style, production style, and that production style now is being produced other places. Right here in California, across the bay from me, St. George Spirits is making a California rum agricole, uh, and it's delicious, and it's, delicious and, and it's made in that style. It's also uh, comparable in style or taste to cachaça, but cachaça doesn't qualify as, as, a, as a rum. It's a very similar product to that French style. When you get into the English styles, or what were known as English styles, the better way to think of that, again, is the production style. And that, that style tends to be one blend, 
blended to uh, considerable use of, of pot stills, which produce a heavier, oilier, more characterful style of rum. And uh, that comes from the British tradition of, of sourcing multiple rums and blending them for use in, in the Navy and, and the British Navy style of rum that evolved during the exploration or the, 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 the robust early uh, rum trade with the English colonies in, in North America and uh, that triangle trade between Britain, the islands, and North America. And uh, so you've got those, you know, Jamaica and Barbados being the, the original core of those, the original rums, the early rums, making those heavier styles of rums. And then what falls into more of the Spanish style would be what evolved more out of Cuba and uh, then into Puerto Rico and this lighter style of rum that really evolved after the introduction of the coffee still in the early 1800s and adapted into Cuba around 1848 or so um, with uh, Bacardi being a, a primary player and making that happen and then later the evolution of Havana Club and other styles in Cuba creating this lighter distillate that was made using a good amount of column still rum and a lot of times 100% column still rum. So you, with the column still you have a finer distillation of the rum that produces really light and, and uh, um, very quaffable kind of rum that is really great in mixing. Uh, the, the mojito came out of that obviously and, and uh, eventually the Cuba Libre. And these lighter rum, style rums compared to the, the maybe the grassier style from the, one other production method and a heavier style from bigger use of, of pot stills. So those all fall in those categories of, of those three names, but if you, once you remove those names and you think about the production processes behind them that make those flavor characteristics and aromatic characteristics come through in those regions, then you can look at the global perspective of rum and how people are making rum and, and really hone in on production processes as a uh, real core differentiator rather than these three different kind of ethnic or, or, or historical uh, names that, that or buckets that you can put them into. Yeah, I mean, the, the problem lies where um, you have, for example, the, the 18 brands that are uh, form part of the, the Fenta Caribbean rum mark. Um, the Dominican Republic is the 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 Latin, so the main Latin uh, country. Uh, you have uh, Belize as well, it's uh, Central America and Suriname and South America, but. Most of the islands are of British origin, and many of them use column stills. Uh, Angostura fine rum is is uh, of a column still, and it would be classified as a British uh, uh, rum. But uh, obviously, there are many many uh, brands that that blend uh, column and pot still. So the the difficulty is, I th I completely agree that that it's more about production methods. But how would you? Uh, Danny, I'll go back to you because you, you, you said it was important to, to uh, teach or introduce these, these aspects to bar bartenders. How would you go about uh, that education and, and how, how do you think a, a, a campaign such as this one, uh, where it's based on education, can help you know, uh, rum as a category to be more understood by professionals? Um, I think that, um, yeah, like whether or not, I mean, for bartenders and educating bartenders, they do want to know as much as they can about the spirit and how it's made and so that they can, in turn, um, educate their consumers who are drinking the drinks. Um, the most Im important thing, I think, when talking to bartenders is going back to what H was saying about the the classifying uh, the stills and the production methods. I mean, until you really can, until you really taste uh, the difference um, of the rum side by side, something that's made in a column still or a pot still, you can't really. I, I mean, for me, coming into rum and not really, you know, in the beginning of your career, not really knowing like what the you know difference of distillation method is going to taste like in the glass, you're not really, you don't. 
I don't think you have a grasp of it until you do those side-by-side -side tastings. So that is a really important education tool is to actually, you know, besides learning about what the, the differences on paper are, is to actually taste the differences of those rums in the glass side-by-side -side and, and make your own opinion as to what the flavor profiles are going to come from the production methods and, um, you know, whether or not they're grouped in historical methods of, you know, saying French, English, you know, um, style rums, then until you can actually taste those differences, you're not really knowing. I mean, and I think that that's the most important tool is, is um, in education is tasting what those differences are and being able to compare them so that you know for yourself so that you can then go ahead and educate people when you're talking to them about why they would be, why this rum would be good, better mixed in a cocktail, why this rum would better be sipping and what flavors you're looking for when you are, when you're tasting those. Yeah, Gabby, I was just, I was curious to, 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 to find out if, like we're saying, this is more of a historical classification as, as H pointed out. I'm curious to, to, to learn if it actually, you know, uh, has any influences on sort of the, the not, not the rum producing um, uh, territories, but the rum consuming territories. So, for example, in Canada, in Montreal, with the French uh, um, uh, historical uh, background, is there more of a, a French style agricole rum taste or is, are the main rum brands uh, uh, British or Latin uh, style, if we follow this classification? Yeah, if we follow this classification, no, actually it's the opposite. There is not really a French style um, culture rum issue in Quebec. Um, I think that uh, Quebec has a lot of um, difficulties to have uh, good information about spirit because of the control of the SAQ. Okay. Uh, who make things really difficult, and mm. um, it's kind of we have only one distributor of spirit, so they say what they want and they promote what they want. And actually, we have a lot of Spanish um, and a, a style of rum that we have. And most of the time, when you talk about um, French style to uh, customers, uh, they don't really know that uh, this uh, exists. Like they don't really know that cachaca exists um, if you compare it to just another um, type of sugarcane spirit, and um, more and more is coming. Like people discover a little bit what is it rum, but uh, also there's a lot of um, missing information about production and about where exactly it's come from, and um, you know there's a uh, Bacardi is a little bit everywhere. Um, here at Abana Club is a little bit everywhere. Um, it's hard to find small batch from Chairsman Reserve, um, what I discovered um, in, uh, in, the, in the Caribbean. Um, nobody knows that from here. And it's really great to run really like um, handmade and stuff. But, and here people are really used to drink um, industrial uh, so it sounds like uh, we have a lot of work to do, but a great opportunity in, in Quebec. Uh, yeah, a lot of work. They, they don't know us. They don't know what's waiting for them. Uh, Jason, um, what, what, is, what is the rum culture uh, of New York? Um, what, what sort of knowledge do you sense, both on an industry and a consumer level? Uh, do people, do people uh, know the differences between rums, and do they care? What is your opinion? Well, uh, in New York, the consumer base, uh, rum and cokes are still king. Um, right. If I was going to talk to a consumer at a bar about a, a French style, uh, English style, or a Latin style rum, they wouldn't know what I was talking about. Right. Um, when people when people think of rum, I think the consumers think of rum. They think of your Latin style, your light, uh, almost vodka esque, um, Bacardi style rums. Um, people are getting more into, especially with the rise of popularity of bourbon, are, are getting more into the um, the brown the brown rums, the aged rums, more of the English style rums uh, for sipping. Um, 
but yeah, consumers don't really relate to uh, that kind of classification. And they don't really think of rum as having distinct uh, differences so much as it just being rum. Um, on the, uh, the trade side, um, you know, we were all trained, I was trained with these, these different styles as a way of kind of, uh, you know, dipping your toe into this, this broad pool of, 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 of knowledge of, of, uh, of differences in rum. But it was never really kind of um, broadened or really, uh, uh, we never really went further into it than just these styles and the, uh, the cultural or colonial uh, heritage behind it. Um, you know, aside from just uh, you know the production, the production methods behind it, uh, with the Latin styles being more more column heavy and, and lighter and elegant, and your your English styles being a, a little heavier with more use of pot still, a little more funk, a little more character, and then your your grassy uh, French styles, which you know still aren't very aren't very popular, not as popular as uh, your English or, or Latin styles. Um, so there's a lot of work to be uh, a lot of work to be done there. Um, and I don't know if, if that's something that would ever be of use uh, on the consumer side. I think the best way to, to approach it would be looking at your base, you know, your uh, your distillate base. Um, is it sugarcane juice? Is it you know sugarcane syrup? Is it molasses? And then looking at the uh, the stills involved. So rather being a you know describing um, a rum as being you know a, a, an English style, you would maybe describe it more as oh it's a molasses uh, column pot blend. Right, and if we can start using that kind of language, uh, I think that's a little bit more more useful, and that'll be definitely um, uh, better for the trade and for for the consumer. I see. Um, and Jason uh, made a, a a point about you know being a, a rum and coke market. Uh, if 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 somebody knows about rum and coke, it's Miguel, who like I has lived in Spain for a while, and. Um, you know, there was a saying in Spain that it is, uh, "What am I going to drink with my Coke tonight?" So that's uh, that's a huge uh, challenge for us. And I was curious to know how is rum drank in one of the Latin uh, style countries, and how do you think that we can change or not change? Because it's drinking rum and Coke is a fantastic drink, but at least expand people's uh, knowledge and interest. Um, yeah, in Spain it was so so popular the rum and coke that actually the Cuba Libre derived in Cubata, which is another name for that, and eventually it became anything with coke, and then later anything mixed with the soda. So uh, that, that was in Spain. In Latin America, they don't have it really. They don't have it with cola. They have it neat or with some lemon and sugar, or lemon and honey, or lemon and molasses, which is a very common thing to have here. You know, when you're a kid, you will you'll be given a couple of spoons of molasses, just in, as a, as, a, as an enhancer of vitamins, enhancer. So that's what's really popular here. Neat. If you, I mean, there are two kinds of people drinking rum here: uh, people who's got money, and he, and people who doesn't have money. And that's everything that works here, not only for rum, but for Pretty much everything here socially, they're very, very, very separated. The class, social classes. Uh, so when it comes to drinking rum, uh, you still see the difference. Um, people who's got money, they drink it neat, aged rums, expensive rums, boutique rums. Uh, people in the countryside, they would still have it neat. They would just uh, have a, a bottle of caballito that they call it. That's the name they have it for that. Uh, they would just be dancing with whoever of three, four with wives and girlfriends and everyone there with their little bottle in the, you know, in the back pocket. That's a typical way of drinking rum here. Now the rest of the people, there are probably 70% of the people here, as have, uh, I mean, this is my experience here so far. Um, the other way of drinking rum is the way um, that they offer to tourism. So probably 60 or 70% of the style of drinking rum here it's not the local style, but the tourists come in here. Um, you know, they've been waiting for a whole year for their vacations to come here and have a Cuba Libre or a Daiquiri or a, or a Mojito or something like that. But that's not really what local people drink. I see. Interesting. So, um, how do you think, um, uh, you know, uh, 
Miguel just gave us a, a great insight into how you know rum producers drink their rum. Uh, but um, I would like to know from a, a trade perspective, Peter, how do you think that that um, you can guide people into further interest? What has bourbon done, in your opinion, to increase people's interest in spirit? I think bourbon and uh, scotch actually have done a couple of key things uh, to to expand on the category, and that's they have found their vehicle of how to uh, present the spirit to people. Uh, with scotch, I think they've done a great job in terms of the presentation material. There's some beautiful scotch glasses out there. Uh, you'll find in a lot of magazines these days beautiful ways of um, uh, producing ice, whether it be ice stones or ice cubes for the scotch. And people really start to geek out about that. Or they'll, they'll, they'll in finer scotch establishments, they'll provide people with um, droppers to drop. Um, distilled or purified water or water from the source on top of that scotch. So that's become key is the, the discussion of water and scotch and whether do you ice it down or not ice it down or how do you get it cold or is it room temp or barrel strength. Uh, I think scotch has done a great job of teaching people or giving people a vehicle how to, how to consume it. Bourbon um, has done as, that as well with uh, the old fashioned right now in the U.S. The old fashioned is, has become almost the, the rum and coke. Uh, you know, everyone's drinking old fashions now, and there's uh, people are recognizing that you have to treat different bourbons a different way. Uh, rum, I think, uh, for its different varieties, does need to still find that um, vehicle. Uh, tequila is another great example. You know, tequila over the last few years, and I've worked with tequila a lot. We've gotten people to take tequila out of the margarita and put it into a copita. Or, or, or a tasting glass and recognize that tequila can and should be sipped. There's a lot of beautiful nuances that have been lost in that tequila by putting it into a heavily sweetened margarita, uh, maybe made with inferior, inferior products. I think rum still needs to do that. I think we need to find out how, what vehicle do we have. I actually think I talked about this on the last hangout. Um, how do we present rum or the different styles of rum to the consumers? No, that's, that's key, uh, definitely key. Um, uh, I, we, we've been talking for about 40 minutes, and uh, uh, I don't want to keep you guys any longer. Uh, we have, uh, we'll have these monthly hangouts, so um, we'll, we'll be sure to cover more run-related stories and, and, and uh, uh, information on the next um, hangouts. Uh, I want to say thank you to all of you, uh, uh, Peter, uh, Miguel, Jason, H, and Danny. Um, it's been a pleasure. We'll, we'll make sure we'll share... Uh, the Hangout uh, on our social media pages and stay tuned for uh, dates, training uh, in uh, Vancouver, Montreal, San Francisco, New York uh, and Chicago coming up very, very soon. Uh, thank you guys, thank you very much. Uh, we'll, we'll see each other on the next Hangout. Enjoy, thank enjoy you. Punta Cana, Miguel. <laughs> Ciao guys, thank you. <laughs>